welcome to Your Need to Know. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and joining me today is Dahlia Palchik. She is a member of the Fairfax County School Board. She represents the Providence District. Welcome, Dahlia. Thank you, Katherine. Such a pleasure to be here. So you were elected in 2015. You were mm-hmm. unseated an incumbent school board member. Um, you tend to be, you, I think you drop the median age for the school board <laughs> because you're a, you're a younger person. And so you brought a different perspective to the school board, not just as a young person, but you came all the way up through Fairfax County Public Schools, Mantua, Frost, yes? Frost, yes. And then Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology. But even more than that, you are an immigrant to this country. And so I don't know if there are any other members of the school board that have an immigration story, but you certainly do. And I think that probably has informed how you perceive and understand what is going on in our school system right now. Yeah, no, um, thank you, Catherine. It's always a pleasure. Uh, It is, I think it's, um, it's hard. I was just talking to someone yesterday uh, that it definitely is one of the main reasons I decided to run. But I realized those stories growing up, you know, I used to feel like I had to hide it, feel ashamed of it. And so I didn't often tell the immigration story. I often tried to hide that I was an immigrant. Um, and so when I came back as an adult, as a teacher and a, you know, a professional in community development, I said, oh my goodness, not only do we need you know, people representing our kids today, but also teachers and the diversity. So uh, yes, I was six years old when my family moved from Argentina. I still remember uh, my dad was here for a few months trying to find work and he finally found a job, called my mom, said you have two weeks to pack up your life and get here. My mom had never traveled without him, didn't speak a word of English, neither did I. We had my one and a half year old sister with us. My brother stayed to finish the school year. And um, we had to just pack up, get here. She couldn't drive, so um, it was just complete change. And and actually for the first few years, very, um, you know, very difficult with the, with the um, immigration and with uh, visas were always temporary, depending on the job. And so it wasn't until 1992, uh, a few years later, when we had the first green card lottery. Um, and my dad at that point was making $20,000 a year for a family of six. I was growing up on free meals. My mom couldn't buy meat. We couldn't afford to have meat at home. Um, and really you know, struggled day to day to figure out what we were doing and, and how long were we staying. And so the first green card lottery, uh, I actually love that my PO box is at Maryfield Post Office because my mom waited for a week in line outside of the post office. Um, We applied, sent in 500 letters, uh, and luckily we were one of the few who were chosen uh, and it completely changed our lives. So um, definitely saw the struggle of having insecurity and not knowing what was happening. And then once we had a residency, my parents were able to start small businesses, uh, buy our first home, and really, you know, start to build a life here. So I guess when I came back and I saw now, uh, when I was growing up, that was definitely a minority of us in that situation and more and more kids, you know, um, we have kids from every country in the world and almost a third are living in poverty today. So to me, that is, was definitely the number one reason um, and to see parents who do everything they can, work two, three jobs, share apartments so their kids can be in Fairfax County Public Schools. And, and you are committed to that. I mean, you're committed to all of the children in the public school system. But your experience has taught you the difference that education can make. So you went from speaking no English at the age of six to going through ESOL to ending up at Thomas Jefferson High School of Science and Technology, which is like the number one high school in the country. Yeah, it's quite a story. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah, no, and and it's hard to think about because I know, uh, I still remember my teacher, my sixth grade teacher, I loved so much. And I said, that's what I want to do in life. And as hard as things were, you know, adapting uh, and from my parents to adapt and to understand what was happening in the system. I, as many kids today, end up becoming a pseudo parent, translating for your parents. Luckily, we have more resources for that than we used to. Um, but you really, suddenly parents feel like they're at a loss. They don't know what's happening. They don't understand the system. And so it really is about supporting kids and families so that all kids have a chance to succeed. I think what we've seen in Fairfax County is, yes, we're a great school system overall. And we have some excellent schools. 
Um, but we need to make sure every kid has access to that, every single student. And so looking at data, looking at best practices, not just saying, you know, you're at a school where most of the kids have the support they need at home, so they're going to be fine. But what are the, about the kids who don't have that? And what about the teaching and the services that we need for those students? And so you're a teacher yourself. So, yes. I, I, so your degree is in anthropology and French, and French. from Rutgers. And you Tufts, have, yes. And you, Tufts, yeah. Tufts. And so you have been an educator in schools, although to be clear, you can't be a teacher in Fairfax yeah. County and sit on right. the Fairfax County School Board. Yes. So you don't teach here. Right. But, you know, being an educator yourself, being a foreign language educator has made a difference too in how you perceive the needs of this very international and diverse population here in Fairfax. Yeah, and that's what I love. You know, I think growing up here, I said, oh, I want to go somewhere much more um, diverse, interested in global matters, which is why I got a scholarship and was able to go to Tufts University, uh, which I loved and studied abroad. I love languages, so I think I was probably the only senior at TJ my year taking two foreign languages at the same time. Um, and then I actually did international development. So I worked in poverty and microfinance uh, with Professor Mohammed Yunus and um, just, you know, was working on projects around the world. And I remember coming back here and saying, oh my gosh, we have poverty here. We have rising levels of poverty that people don't necessarily see in some parts of Fairfax County. Um, and we have kids from all over the world. We're a little model UN right here. Yes, yes we are. And so in a county that has great wealth, I believe the current number of Title I elementary schools is 48. 40, wow. I yeah. think it used to be 41, but I think it's 48 now. And so there is diversity not just in um, where people come from or where their families are from, but in socioeconomic right. resources. And so there's been a great deal of talk in this county about equity mm -hmm. and a commitment to equity in the county. Tell yeah. us a little bit about some of the programs you're the most excited about right now. Yeah, no, and so one of the, I think, excellent things that we do in Fairfax County is I believe we're one of only a handful of counties where we signed a joint uh, resolution policy between the County Board of Supervisors and the school, the school board, the schools, called the One Fairfax Policy to address this as a whole. Because I think what we've noticed and what we know in, in research is that you can't just address problems in school. You can't just address poverty in one area and not in another. We have to look at the way we do business in the county. So the way we in the schools create our school boundaries, the way the county does development and redevelopment so that we are not creating these pockets of poverty, um, which I now serve on the joint, uh, the planning commission's joint uh, committee with the schools. So uh, Sandy Evans and I serve there. And we are revising and looking at the policies of what is it that the county can do differently in the planning commission to try to address some of this so that we have more distribution of wealth in our county um, and on the school side as well, things that we need to look at. So one of the big things that we've been working on um, for the past couple of years and Dr. Brabrian, our excellent new superintendent who's also bilingual uh, and a big fan of his, when he was principal at Fairfax High School, had closed the achievement gap for Hispanic students there. And so really looking at knowing at data, at best practices, how do, we, how do we close that? Because we haven't been doing that for the past few years. So one of the things that we did is that now our chief uh, academic officer has become our chief academic and equity officer, and there is an equity office below him. And in that office, uh, for the past year, he's been working on a, a report card. So it's an equity report card. It will be published very soon. And it will show, uh, based on all our four main goals, so looking at student success, looking at a caring culture, at our, um, our workforce, and at our stewardship of our resources, where are the areas where we really need to show where we are across the school system, how, what access students have to early childhood education, to closing the digital divide, to you know, attaining the scores across the board, so not just one subgroup, but all of our groups and all of our students, looking at discipline, looking at, um, at the kind of um, access they have to college and career readiness. So across the board uh, in a diverse workforce, a report card to say, you know, yes, we're great, and we love to say all the great things <laughs> we do, but we also need to, you know, like a student, address where we have challenges and where we need to have growth. So that is one of the main things that um, Dr. Duran, the Chief Academic Officer, is working on, and we're looking forward to seeing the final version. 
and uh, in his office as well, which our uh, Minority Student Achievement Oversight Committee has been asking for for many years, we will have our first ever uh, family and student ombudsman. So wow. this is an excellent you know, uh, new office, but held by someone who knows the system very well. It is actually one of my principals in my region, Dr. Uh, Mr. Armando Perry, who is the proud uh, son of Cuban immigrants. Wow. Um, and he grew up in Fairfax County, like myself. He is bilingual, and he was most recently principal at Pine Ridge, um, Pine Springs, sorry, elementary school. So he's our first ever ombudsman and he will be an independent uh, place where students, families can go to address issues uh, to help resolve any issues that arise, whether it be related to, you know, it could be related to um, just diversity issues, to special needs, uh, to any area where they feel like, okay, at my school I've tried, you know, I've gone to my teacher. So I've you're kind of, it's some place to escalate the issue between I've tried to work with the classroom yes. teacher, I've gone to the principal, exactly. I still don't feel like my issue's been resolved. So instead of jumping above to the superintendent or you've got this person who tries to negotiate yeah, exactly. a resolution? Yeah, so it will be, part of his job will definitely be, you know, problem solving. And we always, and, and I try to, you know, we're trying to communicate more and more, solve it at your school first, do your right. best. And if not, there is a place to go where you can don't have to fear retaliation where he will review every case, you know, and, and try to resolve the problem. Uh, and in addition, he will be our, our Title IX coordinator. So it really is a very important office and that will be visible. Uh, people will know we have 190,000 students. It's a lot. <laughs> and so sometimes it's very hard to navigate. Um, so this, this committee, the Minority Student Achievement Oversight Committee, is also in the process of creating a new version of a uh, handbook they made years ago, uh, Family handbook to help s parents understand how to navigate the system, where to go, what some of the acronyms we use are, because we use all kinds of acronyms. Too much jargon everywhere. <laughs> There's a lot of jargon, so we're trying to work on that. Um, and to know, you know, we have so many excellent programs, not everyone knows how to access them. That's true. And so we really want to address um, and, and keep our system from becoming more divided um, and ensuring students have access geographically, uh, which is pretty big, as well as you know, for their group, for socioeconomically, and in their own school. And so, when we return from this break, we're going to continue to talk with okay. Dahlia about some of the programs that are taking place in Fairfax County. To her point, not all of us know what's going on in Fairfax County. It's a large school system with a lot of moving parts. So please join us after the break. Marie, you have prediabetes. Prediabetes? I don't have time to eat right or exercise. I'm a busy mom. Oh, you're a busy mom. Yeah. This is great news. Busy moms never get prediabetes. Wait, what? Let me just... Yeah, this is all the people at risk for prediabetes, and way over here, busy moms. No? Whew. So how was work? It was 1,300 hours. My math class from 302 was in the trenches. Davy Roth had it the worst. Fractions were coming at him left and right. He just didn't get the damn things. Two days ago, I tried to teach him what one-fourth of one-half was using different sizes of blocks. Yesterday, I tried again by dividing up pizza. Both missions failed. Oh, no. But today, I was ready. I created a combat math game where the only way to beat the enemy is to outfraction them. Davy conquered every last denominator. My game was so successful, mm. the principal is deploying it to math squadrons all over the school. Wow. Anywho, how was your day? Oh, uh, today my boss treated the office to salad wraps. Hmm, <laughs> salad wraps. No. <laughs> Welcome back to Your Need to Know. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, 
And today we are talking with Dahlia Palchik, who is a member of the Fairfax County School Board from the Providence Dis yes. District. Thanks for taking the time to be here. Thank you, my pleasure, Catherine. So you've got, um, one of the things that we've often talked about since we're talking about languages is the importance of keeping languages funded in the schools. The first school board meeting I ever attended, which was well after my own children graduated, was about cutting the foreign language program in elementary school. Jay Frost invited me to this meeting and I'm like, I felt passionately about the fact that of all the programs to cut, we shouldn't be cutting them, we should be expanding them. That's the one thing that in this global economy, in this world we live in, that is an asset to students, is not being monolingual. Right, um, and as a foreign language teacher, world language teacher, I highly agree with you. Uh, I think what we come across is, um, and we just had a report on this, is the challenges and, and where are the opportunities and what will it take to get there. So, for instance, one of the, the things that we have done really well and are known for in Fairfax County is our elementary school immersion programs. And so we've had them in several languages for the past 30 years um, where students, when they're primed to really be immersed in a language, are able to have that exposure uh, before they get to middle school and then, and then high school, which a lot of school systems have adopted, a lot of independent schools have adopted, and really is you know, the best model. Which, uh, what's challenging with that and, and the difficulty, and as, as I've actually looked at some of the numbers, is the access to those programs and the access you know, equitably to those programs. So uh, for instance, in Providence District, I don't have a single one of those programs inside of my district. Um, and then beyond that kind of areas where we're looking at now to be able to expand is to make it um, much more of a, of a equitable and a best practice is to look at our schools, and we have about 25 elementary schools that are eligible for dual immersion. So that means that at least 35% of the students speak the target language, the other language at home. For us, it's Spanish, um, where 25 of our schools are, have at least 35 students speaking that language, um, and then you know the other half speak English or another language. And so we do have the schools that are eligible, and what's great about that program is that you have it a little bit uh, less isolated. Uh, sometimes it's only the students in that school district who are in the boundary, who are eligible, and um, they get a chance to you know, learn, usually do uh, math and science in Spanish, and then the other subjects in English. And so it's a great program because it means students who are learning English have the ability to practice to it practice, um, and vice versa. It also means that it reduces some of the concerns we have with staffing. A little bit of what's happening is we, we may start with, you know, in first grade or kindergarten, full classes. And then as students become eligible for advanced academic programs in third grade, many drop out of the immersion program. And now you have a very small class size. And so it's great for them, but that means that we don't have those resources for the other programs. It's the allocation the of resources. Right, it's the allocation. So it's a best practice. The other challenge, um, and I've seen this in my own schools, is staffing. It is very difficult to find um, teachers who are certified and who can do both. And actually in Virginia, and we, and we would love our help from our General Assembly on this one, is that currently um, for elementary school uh, immersion teachers, they have to be duly certified. So they have to be both certified as an elementary school teacher and as a world language teacher. Which when you get to high school, you just need the K-12 world language certification. And so that adds another level uh, where really, as long as you're certified to work in elementary school and you can take a test you know, to show your proficiency in the language, you really should be able to teach that. Um, that's and we have enough mean. problems attracting teachers yeah. and retaining teachers because of the pay scale in Fairfax County. So every time you add another certification or another hurdle, it's just as easy for them to take that and go somewhere else where they make more money. Exactly, and um, you know Arlington down the street. Yeah, where they no, have Arlington <laughs> down the street. <laughs> they can't take all our teachers; they're not that large, but they have great programs, and they have um, you know many of these immersion programs. And so, and their salaries. We're still trying to catch up. A, a couple more years, we hope we'll get there with funding from the county and the state. Yes. Um, so that is a hurdle. It is you know, and, and the curriculum. It's world language curriculum has changed so much over the last thirty years, and it's challenging to a set the expectations for what is reasonable to expect out of 
a, foreign, a world language program where you might have it once or twice a week, one where you have immersion half time, uh, one where we don't have those, but you have full time. Right. Um, and then what that means is students go into middle school and high school. So it really, it's something that we're reviewing quite a bit now. I was actually just meeting with staff and we would love to expand other options. So does that mean that we look to start earlier with other languages or as research I have studied also shows, it doesn't really matter which language you start with as long as you learn how to learn a language and then to be able to offer more options and more of our critical languages in middle school and high school. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, most, most children who grow up in a home where they're learning their native language and another language, whether they, you grow up in a Spanish-speaking home and then you learn English at school, or you learn to think in different languages. So your brain is har being hardwired to process language, both spoken and written. So it makes sense that that's when you introduce language if you want to truly have you know, dual language students. Right. And we're not really set up to do that. No, and then I think what it is important is to understand that an, a full immersion program, you will get uh, students coming out with a higher level. When we have uh, what we call foreign language elementary school and uh, learning through content now, which combines language learning with STEAM, which is pretty exciting, but kind mm. of a new, <laughs> an <laughs> extra challenge, uh, is that if you're only having it you know, once, twice, or three times a week, the, ad the advantages are cognitive, as you say, very important for that, um, learning to learn a language, and the, ac and the accent, the pronunciation. W the, besides those three things, if students start in middle school, generally they will achieve the same level of proficiency. So it's kind of explaining to parents, yes, your student might have been in you know, a language program for six years. Um, but they only had it once or twice a week. Right. So we have to be, I think, communicate and understand what our goals are and what the outcomes should be. So I'll throw this one at you. There's yeah. been a lot of discussion la lately about American Sign Language. Mm. They're opening a, a sign language Starbucks across from Gallaudet. Oh, nice. Yeah, right? And so there's just been a lot of things online lately about sign language and the fact that apparently it can be taught, because I'm like, why can't it just be taught as a another language. Why can't American Sign Language be like French or German mm -hmm. or Spanish? And apparently it can be. It's just, again, is there a demand for it? Can you find instructors certified to teach it? You know, do you have enough students in one place to warrant a, a whole class for American Sign Language? Yeah, so that's actually one of my passions. Um, when I went to Mantua, we actually had the Deaf and Hearing Impaired program at Mantua. And I took it as flex, as an after-school program. And I took it because I wanted to communicate with the kids in my class, the interpreters in my class, um, and to learn. I still use, actually, the alphabet. When I teach Spanish, I use the sign language alphabet to give students um, a physical and a visual way to learn the language and practice. And so it is like, um, I think what's interesting about language, unlike math or other subjects, as the, our head of instruction says, it comes in many flavors. And so I think that's where we kind of come across with language, it's what's the flavor of the day? What language right. do people want now? You know, and it changes. And then knowing that you will be able to sustain a program, that you will have kids who will enroll, that you won't have a disparity, you know, huge in class sizes. Um, and so being able to keep up with that and to keep up with the recruitment and retention of staff, um, I think poses some challenges. So. For instance, for deaf and hearing impaired, we, we've been known for having a pretty large program. Uh, my understanding is that with the expansion of cochlear implants, you have less and less students who are in an isolated program or who are you know, um, based so solely mm -hmm. on ASL. And so that has diminished. I know at Woodson, we had a pretty large program, and it's smaller than it used to be. So it's kind of looking at how populations change, whether it's immigration or you know international it's business true. or you know technology and how can we build programs that we can sustain through elementary school middle school and high school and Fairfax County also has the Academy program which yes. is very unique most school systems do not have a system where you've got an Academy for the culinary arts or musical theater or fashion design or you know digital communications but we do, and we bust the students around the county so that they can take advantage of that. Because the other issue that we have, and this is true of um, after-school programs, is transportation. Mm -hmm. You know, even if you can make programs available, not every student can get to them because they ride the school bus back and forth, and there's no way to get them 
to and from an after right. school program. Yeah, and actually the academies is one area we're looking at to expand at the high school level some of our offerings right. for foreign lang for world language. You know, um, you can only get so far doing online, um, right. but through our academy we could probably do a little bit more. Um, but looking at other areas where students, you know, from the whole system could access a language. The transportation, that's one area that I'm also very passionate about. Uh, I didn't want to leave the city. I didn't want to buy a car, but I finally, you know, bought a car and moved out to the suburbs again. And, um, and in D.C., they have a program that we're starting to kind of veer that way of, uh, you know, bus, free bus for kids. Yeah, the um, bus passes so, for so middle and the high school kids. So we now have them for middle and high school kids. They're only for the city bus and the Fairfax connector, the Q. Right. So they can't be used on WMATA buses yet. I hope right. just yet. Um, and so what's great about that is when it's on a bus route that students can use, it's a great way for them to get around, for them to access programs. I think what we need to work on more collaboratively is how do we increase or how do we look at that which transportation right is a whole larger issue so that um, more of students and actually families, I would love for parents to be able to access that as well. Right, because parents, when you're asking them to come to the school, I mean, we've got schools in Fairfax County, and again, I mentioned the number of um, you know, Title I schools, there's schools yeah. that don't have PTAs. Yeah. You know, you have a large proportion of working families and there's just not the leadership there. And so it is a challenge. And part of that challenge is variable work schedules mm -hmm. that people don't always know when they're going to work. But the other thing is a lot of them don't have transportation. Yeah, no, and it's huge. And, um, and so the transportation and then affordable housing, right? I was just saying. That is huge. That is huge. Um, we have, I believe, a need for at least 30,000 units now. It's going to double in the next few years. And it's not just for the families and the children who go to school. It's mm -hmm. for workforce housing, which includes teachers. There's a lot of teachers who can't even afford to live in the districts where they work. So, Yeah, and quite a few. And actually, we see that more and more is not only is it our our salaries that need to keep up, but many teachers are saying, well, you know, I might take a salary cut in Prince William or Loudoun, mostly Prince William now, but I can afford to buy a home there. Right. Um, I feel that, I, you know, yeah, it's know. very hard to, but I know I don't want to leave, and so you make it happen, but it is, it's a challenge for our workforce, for our families, um, and for our families who don't want to move their kids, don't want to have to go far away. Uh, that's why originally, when I first heard a story on a bus, uh, two women talking about, not wanting to move um, because her son was just so happy at school. And so I think we need to definitely in, be a voice um, and address this holistically as a whole county. Well, I appreciate you having having you on the school board, Dahlia. I know that you are up for re-election, I think, in 2019. 2019. So this is what you need to know about Dahlia Palchik of the Fairfax County School Board.